Jesus Christ that brings us together. Good morning again, everyone. Today is our um, week four of our um, 40 days of community campaign. And um, today we shall be focusing on something that we will be doing actually um, together as, um, as a community. As we embark on the seven week journey of community building based on Acts 2:42 to 47, it's, it's amazing that we're doing this in this most difficult time. So I, I've mentioned this to you at the very beginning, you know, like probably four weeks ago that it's ironic. It's, it's quite, you know, like, yeah, I mean, to me, it's tragic even that we are trying to prom promote community, but at the same time, we cannot actually have close contacts um, with each other. Uh, and we should avoid, you know, like um, large gatherings. And it's not really encouraged at, at this time. But you know what? Uh, this is not the first time that the Christian community is experiencing big challenges. The good news is that after more than 2,000 years, you know, uh, the church continues to flourish all over the world. So let's not be gripped with, gripped with fear, but with the hope that God is very much in control. Do you believe that, brothers and sisters? Yes? God is very much in control. Can we say that together? God is very much... <laughs> okay, not much conviction there, right? God is very much um, in control. So let's, um, let's continue this series um, as, as we move along. Again, like what we said, the foundation of the series is in Luke, Acts. Luke being the gospel and Acts being the gospel in action. And we summarized everything in terms of the word expressed and embodied in Jesus is God's message of reconciliation and forgiveness that is proclaimed through the world through the empowerment of the Spirit. Now, those who are recipients of the wonderful message of salvation, us, are now tasked to propagate this message. And as we grow in numbers, we form communities. And that is basically the church. So this is the summary. And I was just looking at it. If you're a basic Christian, if you know this, this story arc, you can proclaim the gospel to anyone. You tell them that, you know what? In the beginning... <laughs> This is what happened, and everything incarnates, you know, like in terms of um, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'd just like to pause here for a while, um, just to, to point out the centrality of, of Jesus here. See, our religion is based on the embodiment of the Word in Jesus. You know, the Word becoming flesh. Are you with me, Central? It's, it's about that. It's not some strange ideas, and then these strange ideas just continue on, okay? It's not a philosophy. It's not like, you know, like some, some sort of teaching. But the teaching is embodied in flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why your presence is very important because, and that's why I struggled with the, you know, like no close contacts, you know, like no interaction because... It cannot be that way. Our religion is anchored on the Word becoming flesh in Jesus. Jesus became like one of us. Okay? Are you, are you following me here? Um, because I saw one discussion on Facebook again, so I'm, I'm, I'm into social media. There's one professor for missions um, at Moreland College, and she posted, you know, like a proposition. She was talking about the embodiment of Jesus Christ, so of like how Christianity is about the Word becoming flesh. And so therefore, flesh is very important in terms of community building. You need engagement. You need interaction. What about virtual reality? according to her students. What about this emerging thought that you can actually do things without the flesh, without a personal touch? Have you thought about it? And I think this applies even to online churches, right? You know, is the concept of an embodied community being diminished? when it becomes virtual, when it becomes online. And I would just like to, 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 to bring it out here because this is something that we could, be, we could be talking about like in the future. Especially like, for example, the coronavirus. Most of the churches in China went online, right? Um, and then in terms of experiences. Have you seen that news where in, in Korea, although they're ravaged by the, the virus right now, 
they were able to recreate a virtual loved one. You know, like there's this mother, and then she had a kid, and the kid was, died when she was like, I don't know, five years old. And what they did was that to create a virtual world wherein the, the mother can actually interact with the departed child. And that was really creepy. And I, I saw that post, and she was wearing these goggles, you know, like, and she was crying. I think it was turned into a reality TV kind of a, a show. And right at, in that virtual world, she was actually talking to a departed ki a child that's like dead for like a few years. So what happens then to the embodiment concept that we're talking about? But I believe this is, this is something that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I just wanted to add that, some sort of a commercial, you know, like um, as, as we do our, our message for today. So we who are, you know, the embodied messengers form the church, and that's why we appreciate your presence, your tangible, felt presence, okay? I don't want virtual presence or have you, you know, like how when you organize a party and then you cannot make it and it happens to be a Christian gathering, and what do you say? Oh, I'll be there in spirit, right? But we need you here. We need your presence here. So that, that one is like, yeah, a bit off, right? It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be that way. So in the last three weeks, um, oops, this is not working again. Okay. There. It froze. Okay, wait. So in the last three weeks, um, we were talking about the first three things here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship um, and to prayer. So we, 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 we jumped to prayer, and then today we're, we're doing um, breaking of bread. So what did they do? They learned together, right? The, the, the early church learned together. They were taught by the apostles themselves. They taught them the scripture and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit enlightened them to understand the scriptures through the life, the ministry, and the death, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the, the, the early church community learned together. They fellowship together as well. So the word is koinonia. That means the essence of the gathering of early Christians in Acts. It's a distinctive gathering anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ, enabling the people to what? What are the four descriptions that we said about koinonia? Fellowship, sharing, participation, and, and communion. Wonderful. Let's give, a, let's give a hand to Elaine. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you have memorized it already. And then, of course, the believers prayed together. They devoted themselves um, to prayer. Now, according to biblical scholars, the first Christians spent much time in prayer. Prayer is not something new in the Christian community. It's been done by the Jews, and so they pray Jewish prayers as well. They prayed privately, but they often prayed together as a group. And it appears that, that many maintain the Jewish pattern of prayer. But what makes the Christian prayer different is what? And we mentioned this last week. It's a relational prayer anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can call God now our Father, and we are, um, you know, like connected to the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first three things that we've talked about, the apostles' teaching, right, the fellowship, and the prayer happens only because of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's all anchored in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what makes the community distinctive because they're followers of Jesus Christ, okay? So that's, that's, that's how, how it is. Now, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Let me ask you the question, what do you mean by breaking of bread, right? What is the meaning of the breaking of the bread in verse 42 of Acts? Is it a different Breaking of bread as mentioned in verse 46. So the, the breaking of the bread concept here is mentioned in Acts 42. Okay, Acts 2, chap, uh, verse 42, and then verse 46. What is the difference between the two kinds of breaking of bread? Is the breaking of the bread the Lord's Supper? Or are the two mentions of the breaking of the bread in Acts 2 actually the same meal? 
or they're actually two different meals. Okay, if you're still with me, can I have a show of hands of those of you who think that the breaking of the bread is the Lord's Supper? Okay. Now, can I have a show of hands of those of you who think that the breaking of the bread is just a common meal? <laughs> can I have a show of hands of those of you who think that they're the same kind of meals, okay? Meaning, there's a common meal and the Lord's Supper together. Or, okay, <laughs> so there, there, there are those. So we're, that's, that's, that's our topic of conversation um, today. The issue has been debated vigorously, and the Bible translations vary, and commentators different, differ in their views, although there's a common presupposition of what the breaking of the bread means in Acts chapter 2. So let's, let's, let's try to exegete this a bit. But what I'm going to do is basically show you different translations of the Bible and how the breaking of the bread is translated. So this is in the NIV, right? There, that's NIV still. <laughs> okay. Now, this is the whole passage um, in the NIV. Can we read this together? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of the bread. Now, why did I highlight this? Can you see, actually? The, the article there, according to commentators, they say it makes it more special, okay? It's not an ordinary meal, but it's actually a very serious meal, such as the Lord's Supper. So there are some people that with the presence of this one, they say, therefore, this is actually not just a regular meal, but this is the Lord's Supper, okay? They also know that it can't be just a regular meal as it was mentioned side by side with the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the prayer. So if you include that in this whole summary statement, they say the or the breaking of the bread becomes the Lord's Supper, which to me is like, mm, right? <laughs> the thing is, it's a summary statement that I've been telling everyone from the very start of the series that it doesn't mean that this one is prime to all of these and to all of these. So it doesn't, doesn't make a difference whether they're plugged in there. It's more of Luke actually giving us a picture of this is what's happening in the church at that point in time, okay? The NLT tells us this one, which is very, very interesting. All believers devoted themselves to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, okay? So for the NLT translators, they feel that there should be two there. There should be two meals there, the sharing of the meals, and it should be the Lord's Supper. The Good News translation mentions only one. They spend their time in sharing in the, in the fellowship meals. Okay, this is getting interesting. And then this Weymouth, um, Weymouth New Testament qualifies it very explicitly. So it says, and they were listening, they were constant in listening to the teaching of the apostles and in their attendance to the communion, okay? Which is like, yeah, the communion. Um, and that is the breaking of the bread with the, capital B there, and that prayer, implying that he, they're talking about what kind of meal? The Lord's Supper, basically. That's very, very explicit. And in the Aramaic Bible, in plain English, it says they were continuing in the teaching of the apostles, and they become partakers in prayer and in breaking of the, the Eucharist, which is the Thanksgiving meal, which is basically the Lord's Supper. Now, why am I doing this? Why am I, like, trying? Because it's very important for us to know, really, what is going on in the mind of the writer and what, was, what he was trying um, to do. Now, to make it plain to you guys, this is basically the pre presupposition of biblical scholars. The breaking of the bread could be a common meal, okay? When you share a meal with your friends, Christian friends, that is a common meal. It could be a fellowship meal. It could be like our international fellowship, you know, and we eat together. It could be a memorial meal in commemoration of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it could be the supper that the Lord Jesus Christ instituted before he died. 
You know that on the night that the Lord was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, and offered it to his disciples um, in prayer. You know, so that's, that's basically where all of these um, suggestions are coming from. In Acts 2.42 and in 20 verse 7, some, some would suggest that Luke may well have in mind the full Pauline. Okay, this is about Paul. Pauline's understanding of the Lord's Supper. And that's what David Pocklington read this morning. Okay, so this is what's happening here. Okay, I just want to make this simple because I don't want to over time. The early Christians gathered together and they ate together. They broke bread together. Basically, that's how it is. And this is my thinking, that they started having fellowship meals. But eventually, as Christianity developed, the fellowship meal or the Thanksgiving meal now had some sort of a sacramental change. That means it became more than just like a regular hanging out, eating together. It became a more sacred kind of an exercise among them. That's why when Paul was telling the people, before you eat, you need to examine yourself. You cannot be a glutton partaking of the meal because if you're hungry anyway, then you can just go home and eat first before you partake of the meal. So the meal has not now become more of a ceremonial meal rather than a meal for everyone to enjoy, right? So that's the thing. Now, the problem here is if we say that the, what, what we're talking about here is the Lord's Supper, when we go now to verse 40, um, 46 of Acts chapter 2, um, it talks about something else, right? So this is what's happening in Acts 42 to 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple course and they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So it's a very frequent exercise which goes against the argument that actually you do communion every week. Right. This one is like an everyday gathering of people. But they say, actually, every day here refers to the temple and not really the breaking of the bread. But anyway, that's how you do exegesis. Let's, let's go to the ESV. ESV says, and day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they receive their food with glad and generous hearts. So this is a very casual meal. And that's why we're, they're saying is the first acts breaking of the bread account is a formal one simply because it's with fellowship, apostles teaching. This one is a genuine um, fellowship together. In uh, the GWT version, the believers had a single purpose and they went to the temple every day and they were joyful and humble as they ate at each other's homes and shared their food. It doesn't look like the Lord's Supper to me. It's like a fellowship meal, okay? Following? And then in the King James Version, can we read this together? And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and with single heart. I chose this version because it mentioned meat, so it goes against the vegans, right? <laughs> anyway. But if this is the Lord's Supper, it's it has the normal kind of food. There's, there's meat there, and it's not even, you know, like the bread um, and the wine together. And in the NLT, the NLT is like a bit dodgy, right? Because it, it, it now, this is what it says. They worship together at the temple each day, met, met in homes uh, for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. So it brings the Lord's Supper back um, into the equation, which tells us, okay, so what is happening here? Are they just having normal meals? Are they having the Lord's Supper? Are they having a normal meal followed by the Lord's Supper? Or, or what, what is happening? Why would Paul, you know, like be strong in saying that you guys have violated the meal because you have become gluttons. You don't wait on each other. You don't, you don't share together. And I reckon that is... That is basically where the, the, the warnings in, in, in the Corinthians passage is coming from. The essence of the gathering together more than is it a ceremonial or is it just a fellowship meal? Because you know what? The attitude of people having fellowship meals is basically this. Number one, it's a regular gathering, okay? So it's not just once a year. People meet up. So what I'm saying here is like if we're really a community of faith, we should be hanging out 
over meals together because that's that's and we're not what what is the anchor of the the meal the meal is not just for the food okay what brings you together is basically the lord jesus christ they shared the food together with let's read this together with joy and with gladness it is with humility and sincerity with generosity and with the singleness of heart right so that this is what characterizes the breaking of the bread okay which is something that we don't see in the lord's supper right it was gone when the lord's supper became a ceremonial commemoration it seems that yeah it became once a month or it became once a year for some it became like lent or christmas time for some other christians um, in terms of the attitude when we approach the lord's supper there's there's not much i don't know i can't judge <laughs> okay but it seems that there's not much joy and gladness it's very very serious you know um that's 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 how it is and i think that's 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 where why am why i'm trying to dig this um together you know that's that's how it is now how does the lord's supper look like the picture that we have is the one in luke 22 so if you have your bibles with you especially the kids i know you have your phones and you're playing with your phones right now but can you open your apps in luke 22 7 to 20 so this is the this is jesus's commemorative um lord's supper so this is how it is have you found it luke 22 7 to 20 okay i'm gonna read right then came the day of the unleavened bread on which the passover lamb had to be sacrificed jesus sent peter and john saying go and make preparations for us to eat the passover so this is the passover meal you know before jesus was betrayed during the time they need to commemorate the passover meal what were they trying to commemorate during the passover meal you know like it's when the angel of death passed over the houses of the israelites you know like with the blood that kind of thing they commemorated that what what does the meal comprise of unleavened bread and bitter herbs which means basically they're in a hurry because they need to go out you know like they need to go out you know to to the promised land so that's how it is now they want us to prepare where do you want us to prepare for it verse 9 they asked verse 10 he replied as you enter the city a man carrying a jar of water will meet you follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house the teacher asks, where is the guest room where i may eat the passover with my disciples he will show you a large room upstairs all furnished and make preparations there verse 13 they left and found things that just as jesus told them so they prepared the passover when the hour came jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and said to them i've eagerly desired to eat the passover with you before i suffer for i tell you i will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of god and this is what jesus says so they're having a party there gathering of the disciples and then he said after taking the cup he gave thanks and said this take this and divide it among you for i tell you i will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of god comes he took the bread gave thanks broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you so this is the type of the lord's supper that paul the apostle paul visited in his writing in first corinthians what he said there is that it seems that the practice of the lord's supper has lost its value because people have violated it people came just to eat and to you know like and people didn't wait on each other so that's how it is now the lord's supper is um not just a meal that you share together you know like when the meal becomes a commemorative meal um dedicated to the lord jesus christ then the act of reverence comes in there it's an act of remembrance okay the lord's supper is an act of remembrance so when jesus said do this in remembrance of me 
So that means when you partake of the bread and you drink from the cup, you remember the Lord Jesus Christ. Question, is it possible to remember Jesus when we're just having a normal meal? Can we do that? Like when you're, like after lunch, for example, you go to World Square, you ate at Din Tai Fung, and you were having your noodles, and your Xiao Long Bao, or, yeah, don't miss the golden liquid, you know, like that kind of thing. Do you reckon when you're having fellowship meal with a fellow Christian, is it possible to remember Jesus? Who says yes? Who says no? See? So, yeah. It's an act of remembrance. It is possible to do that. Now, the Lord's Supper is also an act of proclamation because when we remember Jesus, as we eat together, we are proclaiming the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And actually, your presence as a believer is a testimony of what Jesus Christ has done, right? The fact that you can fellowship with a fellow brother in Christ then that means that you are continuing the narrative. You are continuing the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord's Supper is an act of proclamation. The Lord's Supper is an act of thanksgiving as well. So the attitude of giving thanks for a meal, remembering the Lord Jesus Christ, it is possible, right? And the, Lord, the, the, the Lord's Supper is an act of communion as well. And what do we say about communion? Gathering together. Right? Now, the Lord's Supper is an act of accountability as well. And this is where Paul is coming. You examine yourself first before partaking, considering others first before you eat. You know? Um, one of the biblical scholars who tried to study this, and I, I read it, it's a bit technical, but what they're saying is like Paul was very upset with the Corinthians. Because apparently, the pattern of gathering together during the time is more of like potluck, okay? Uh, this is a proposition. They say, each one bring your BYO, right? Bring your own dish. Um, and you have a mixed group of Christians during that time. You have rich Christians, you have poor Christians. So definitely, the rich people can have bigger plates compared to the you know, like the poorer ones. The thing is, the attitude is never about sharing. So I BYO my big lunch, and I just eat my big lunch for myself. I never share it with the others. That's why they don't wait upon each other, right? And that's why Paul was saying, if you're hungry then, then eat at home and don't act like some glutinous person here, you know, in front of the poorer brothers and sisters in Christ. The attitude should be about sharing together. Now, whether they ate the potluck meal before the actual breaking of the bread, you know, the literal breaking of the bread, we don't really know how it worked. But the essence is still about community. It's about being together, right? So it's, it's, it's an accountability. And of course, the Lord's Supper is an act of hope. It's an act of hope. Now, now, what is your point? <laughs> what is your point, Pastor John? After, you know, like differentiating the breaking of the bread as if it's just a fellowship meal or the breaking of the bread. What I'm trying to tell you here is that I think, okay, this is just my personal take. Our minds are wired to see things in two different realities, right? Right? You know, like one is holy and the other one is not. There is this big dichotomy, okay, big word. There's a big divide between the things that we see as holy and the things that we see as, okay, this is just normal. And I think that's the journey of the Lord's Supper, okay? That's the journey of the Lord's Supper. It's because it took on a sacramental, okay, big word again, a sacramental kind of a form. People have neglected the common meal in preference for something that would make them holy. A commemoration, and there's nothing wrong with that, a commemoration of the death 
and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ together with the community, you know, as an offering. But it shouldn't make the face-to-face, -face, the small gathering of believers less holy and less communal, you know, in terms of its value. Are you with me, Central, right? Are, 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 you, are you getting where I'm coming from? And, and this is something that you won't hear being preached at all. But what I'm trying to help our congregation to see is that everything is under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Everything you do, everything you touch is dedicated under the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's not just the Sunday that is important but also the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, the Thursday, the Friday, and the Saturday. It's not just this church gathering that is important, the community that we form here, and we appreciate it very much, but also the smaller communities that you form. It's not, that you, it's not just vocational calling of being a pastor, being a worship leader, or serving in the church that is important but also your own vocation, being an accountant, being a tradie, being a scientist. Everything is wholly under the lordship of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? Are you following me here, brothers and sisters? So that when we approach the Lord's table, we don't want to be casual about it. We don't want to be disrespectful. However, we need to approach it the same way we're having a meal time with our families, the same way we're having a meal time with our friends, with much joy, with much oneness in the spirit. And again, it's not about the bread and the wine, okay, or the elements that we put here. Come to think of it, if we're, if we're in a deserted island without any wheat or bread, what are we going to eat? We're going to dig like a sweet potato, boil it, and then the pastor will say, okay, he broke the sweet potato. No. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, whatever is available there, it's fine. And then you drink coconut juice, you know, that kind of thing. Because come to think of it, if we will be legalistic about this, if it's wine, then we should be drinking wine, right? But we, we kind of toned it down juice. Although, like, when I was in the Presbyterian Church in Singapore, we have two choices. You can have the juice, and you can have the wine. And the wine is really like, whoa! You know, you feel it there, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, so, so that. In terms of the bread, you know, should it be an unleavened bread? Should, should it be like a home, you know, like baked bread? We're just using loaf bread from Coles, right? And then we just cut it together. So it's not even about the elements. What makes the Lord's Supper or the breaking of the bread, what it is, is again us coming together as a body of believers in Christ. Okay? So, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we partake it with, uh, with, with reverence, but we also with joy. When we go and have our international fellowship lunch, which we have canceled because of the coronavirus until half a year, we approach that with reverence and joy as well. Don't say, ah, oh, they're just having lunch there. It's not important. It's also as important as this one because it's a gathering of believers in Christ. Are you with me? This is the most practical application of what is to break bread. Now, you can break bread with your friends, you can break bread, with, you know, like with, with, with non-Christians, it's fine. What, what makes it special is the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And, and as we partake of the bread and the juice this morning in a pre-packed form, okay, <laughs> which again is controversial. Why? Because of, you know, because we're trying to be careful here. Let's just be happy that we're alive, Right? Let's just be happy that we're surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's just have the joy as if, you know, like that tiny cup is actually a big cup that we share with the rest of the people. So let's prepare our hearts so that our response this morning is basically partaking of the communion with much joy. Okay, Joyce, could you just, let's prepare our hearts um, as we
Let us all stand and let's sing a song and then we shall...